Hi everyone, and welcome to the first of a bazillion different cycles that we're going to learn about in this and like the next two chapters after it. But I do promise this, there's a bunch of cycles. However, we do completely calm down after chapter 12. Until then, things are pretty crazy, but once we get done with refrigeration, things really calm down a lot. So you can do this, breathe deep, we'll get through all these together. Now what's this one? Well, it's the auto cycle. Do you need to remember the names? No, please do not memorize all the names. It's not super important. Um, for all my classes, it's always open book, open notes, so you can always check it there. If your teacher is an open book, open notes, memorize the name. It's going to make things easier on you. Uh, or get a really good flashcard. Okay, what is the auto cycle? It's the ideal cycle for spark ignition engines. Like a car. Nice. Okay. So on the top, I've got the actual. On the bottom, I've got the ideal. And I need to deal with both and figure out how they're different. So first off, when I have an actual cycle, there is intake and there is exhaust. Because there's intake and there is exhaust, that means the air is coming in and the air is leaving. Um, also, heat isn't magically added. Heat is added by combustion. So I compress it. And when I compress it, I am getting it to high temperatures, and then I ignite those through a spark plug. Power is extracted when the um, cylinder expands after combustion, and power is input when it's compressing the air-fuel mixture before combustion. And it looks like this magnificent cycle right here, which is terrifying. And as a note, that's greatly exaggerated, this line right here. Like, a lot of times we just show it as a straight line. But... That's terrifying to look at. How in the world would we ever deal with that? How would we ever be able to calculate information using that? The answer is we wouldn't. So it is why we have to idealize things. So this guy right here is our idealized cycle. We have isentropic compression, isentropic expansion, constant volume heat addition, and constant volume heat rejection. Is that realistic? No. And we will learn how to take into account some of the real world effects like the fact that things aren't usually isentropic in compression and expansion to still calculate things but it makes us give a similar cycle this looks very similar and if I was to draw it it'd be something like this so it is matching up fairly well um, with our actual cycle however to find the ratio of back work here will be much easier i could much more easily do the integral for that than I can for something that is smooth and doesn't have a closed form. I have to idealize things to give myself the ability to calculate things. And all I have to do is remember that my thermal efficiency and my network are always going to be less than what I see here. So in the real world, it's always going to be less than that. Okay, now this doesn't really show you how it works. So I got this nice GIF. And it shows you a little bit of a particular type of the auto cycle. Now the question here is how many crankshaft revolutions does it take to complete the cycle? If you're figuring it out, look for the explosion right there. So top, bottom, top, bottom. So for me, it looks like it's just one cycle. This guy rotates one time, and when it's rotated one time, the cycle is back at the same point. It's usually helpful to look at when it's at top dead center or bottom dead center to try to figure that out. Okay, so this right here, it takes one crankshaft revolution to complete the entire cycle. Now there's four stroke cycles and there's two stroke cycles. So a four stroke cycle is where it takes four strokes. Four strokes being two revolutions up, down, twice. This one here, this is a two stroke cycle. Now, two-stroke engines are less efficient, um, but they are relatively simple to build and they're inexpensive. And they have pretty high power to weight and power to volume ratios. So where do you see this? Honestly, power tools, okay? Power tools, lawn mowers. This is where you see it. And this is one of the reasons they always tell you that like, you know, blowing the leaves off your lawn with a gas power tool or, um, Mowing your lawn with a gas lawnmower is like driving 60 miles in a Miata or something. You know, they, they've, I've heard the terms before. 
The reason is because it's simply less efficient. You're burning a whole lot of fuel, releasing a whole lot of CO2, and producing a whole lot of power, but it's not very efficient in doing that. It's just producing a lot of power all at once because it's burning through a whole lot of energy all at once. So if you can, get that electric lawnmower, get that electric um, leaf blower, and maybe it'll take you a few charges to get everything done, but you'll save the environment while you're doing it. Okay. Now, this guy right here, this is a four-stroke cycle, and thankfully, it's a lot slower. So if you watch it at bottom dead center, okay, so I go down, intake, up, compression, down, combustion, up, exhaust. So that was two cycles, two cycles to finish this. And by separating things out, I'm actually able to have a much more efficient engine and to get a much higher thermal efficiency. Okay, now here's a TS diagram of the ideal auto cycle. One thing I would strongly suggest you do as we go through all these cycles is make yourself a little dictionary of cycles and TS and PV diagrams. Because overall, the TS diagram is always going to look this shape. Like you're not putting numbers on here necessarily, it doesn't have to be to scale. But knowing what shape it is and also which one's constant, um, which one's isentropic, all of that stuff will help you as you're doing problems later. So do that, help yourself out a little bit. Okay, so let's look at these four steps. So first off, I have isentropic compression from one to two. Then from two to three, I have constant volume heat addition. The star moves. Three to four, I have isentropic expansion. Follow the star. And then from four to one, I have constant volume heat rejection. So just what we learned about earlier, just now on a TS diagram instead of a PV diagram. Okay, now one thing to think about is you're like, well, what about the intake and exhaust? Well, since that happens at atmospheric pressure for both, we can more or less say that on a PV diagram, they are constant. The volume is going out, volume is coming back in again, but the area of that volume is zero. So it's not really affecting our cycle, which is why we usually are neglecting it. So if you're wondering, we sometimes call that the zeroth step in our cycle, zero to one, but we don't really deal with that. We're going to ignore it because its overall effect on the cycle is minimal, at least in our idealized case. Okay. <clears throat> and we already talked about all that, so boy, much more things here. So last little detail to talk about here is our compression ratio and our thermal efficiency. Now your book has a long derivation of this thermal efficiency. Okay, I don't give derivations for a lot of things because I don't find it super helpful to go through a bunch of different terms. But your book has it. If you want to see it, it's there for you. But for our auto cycle, one way to get the thermal efficiency is simply to find the compression ratio. And what you see is that our compression ratio is directly related to our thermal efficiency. So 1 minus 1 over Rk minus 1, where k is our ratio of specific heats. Since our ratio of specific heats, that means the specific heat of our working fluid is going to change our thermal efficiency. Whoop. I have a really cool diagram of that later. But as this guy goes up, that means this value on the bottom is going to be bigger. As the value on the bottom is bigger, it means that this right here is going to be smaller and smaller, which means that our thermal efficiency will be greater. So if I can have something that has a greater ratio of specific heats, I can have a much more efficient system. So now we're on to an example, and we'll do that next time. So thank you for listening. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.